do share the same owners. It would be a stretch to imagine that the same things that ADT Moo is treating their employees a little better since they're headquartered here in the U.S., but as we know, just because a company is in the U.S., it doesn't mean that employees are being treated fairly with respect and dignity, or from it in a lot of cases. Again, we can't know for sure what's happening. These are just my opinions based on between them. Let's dive into one other thing that might serve as a bit of a red flag, the counterfeit controversy. <laughs> Too slow. I already brought up my concern that some of the items on Timu just seemed a little too good to be true. But with Timu's sister company, this concern has been ongoing for years. In 2018, the company was hit by an onslaught of accusations and demands. Let's light it up! claimed that Bean Duarduo had been selling counterfeit versions of their products. Right after the company decided to go public in the US, breaking in an impressive valuation of $23.8 billion, news started flooding in that they were likely selling knockoff versions of Chinese products. For example, one of the biggest TV makers in the country, Skyworth Digital Holdings Limited, released a statement that asked Pinduoduo to stop selling fake versions of their product on its website. Around the same time, they had casually removed one of their listings for another television called Xiaomi New Product, which shared striking similarities to products from a Chinese company called Xiaomi Corporation. Look at that, it even had the same name. Apparently, this issue was so pervasive that a writer even claimed on their personal blog that they had pirated his books and were selling those to its customers. Clearly, this was all starting to get just a little bit out of hand. Just one week after they went public, multiple different entities began an in-depth investigation on whether or not they knowingly let their vendors sell counterfeit goods. This included seven U.S. law firms who all swiftly published investor alerts. While areas outside of China also shocked at this revelation and at the seemingly sudden emergence of counterfeit claims, watchdog groups in China didn't share the same level of surprise. James Wong, who is the chief of business development at the company Dropchain, told Forbes, accusations of being dwelled about selling fake products have been going on for a long time before the IPO. In 2017, Pink Wow removed more than 10.7 million problematic products and blocked 40 million links related to infringing products on their site. First things first, holy shit, Batman, that's a lot of fake products. Second, why didn't people know this before investing millions of dollars in the company? It's not like the issue was a secret. In fact, the China e-commerce research center said that the company had received the most complaints out of any other Chinese e-commerce site in 2016. And yet, folks still acted shocked after the company went public that there might have been some problems. Something about that just seems incredibly off to me. Everyone in China seemed to know that this was an issue. In fact, Matthew Brennan, the co-founder of China Channel, said, quote, Would anyone in China be surprised that there are fake goods on any of the major e-commerce platforms? Absolutely not. It's an industry-wide problem. An industry-wide problem. We just want you to keep that one line in your head. Now, regardless, the United States decided to strike fast after the accusations arose. By 2019, they had placed the platform on the blacklist of notorious markets for their sale of suspected counterfeit goods. Obviously, Ping Duanguo responded with a sense of confusion. In a statement, they claimed that they didn't fully understand why they had been added to the blacklist and disagreed with the report. According to them, they were in the process of introducing new measures to ensure that no counterfeit merchants would appear on their site. And they said they were going to work closely with any and all law enforcement agencies to ensure they remove the suspicious products. Again, it seems like the company is still doing all right, though they are definitely a little less trusted by investors in the U.S. now. But I want to go back to that line I told you to keep in your head. An industry-wide problem. Is it, perhaps, possible that in the United States, the investors and the consumers were all once again we falling into the same trap? Timu is not well-known, and it has its base in the U.S., but it works just like Pink Wow Wow. It takes products from Chinese merchants and sells them directly to the consumer. It wouldn't be an incredible revelation that they might also have some issues with counterfeit products on their website. Once again, Adventure this time. hasn't been proven to be true. We don't see any lawsuits right now, but it's definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. If someone tells you there's a problem that runs in the industry, I'm kind of inclined to believe them. Currently, the only real lawsuit Timu is facing, ironically, is actually with Xi'an. 
They accused people of hiring influencers to misrepresent their brand and spread false information about Shein. Don't worry, fact, I got this. Shein believes that Twitter has even tried to impersonate their company to try and trick consumers into thinking they were either the same or associated. Timu adamantly denies these allegations and claims that they are vigorously defending their rights. Now, if Shein were to win, it would actually block Timu from ever using Shein's name in their advertisements in the future, and they would also potentially be entitled to a payout from the company for lost profits. This whole thing is just kind of funny to me, honestly, because this is exactly how they tried to sell me in that sponsorship request. They go, we just like Shein. So, I'll keep watching it, but there's nothing better than seeing two skinny companies brawl it out. And since Tina is so new, there's nobody for certain to tell what they're really about. But if their sister company is any indication, then likely it's not too good. While they may try to entice you with their free products and their cute little games, try not to get distracted. Look a little bit deeper and always do your research when buying things online. While some places claim that it's the safest app of all time with the best products, for us poor, broke Americans who are going through yet another fucking recession, I just don't feel quite as confident. Sure, it is a cheaper option than Amazon by far, but that's not really saying anything when everyone seems to think it does. There are more red flags that I would like to see in a brand new company. Adventure time. I would not at all be surprised if we hear more that's than that about the future in the future and the coming months and years, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. <laughs> U.S. and China tech analyst Rui Ma told Reuters, I think as Timu gets a higher profile, there will be more and more lawsuits. And honestly, I'm inclined to agree. But with all of that being said, that is the end of today's episode about Timu. I, have, I don't think I've ever actually had a company approach me with an advertisement thing, saying we're just like another company, in which a company I literally have just covered. <laughs> tried to tell me that was a good thing for sponsorship. I just, I've never had some. Hello, and welcome to the Corporate Casket, a podcast series where bad businesses go to not. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities and terrible CEOs and businesses that have a lot of fun. I'm the only one on the end today. We're going to be talking about the long requested timeshares. <laughs> I feel like most people nowadays want to avoid timeshares like the plague, and we've all seen some sort of timeshare salesman stereotype on television. You're here for the presentation? I'm Harris Marder. Or not in that spam call, or if you've heard about how timeshares are almost impossible to exit. But that's really been about it. So why would someone buy a timeshare in the first place? Are there any situations where a timeshare is actually worth money? It's my lucky or day. Or is it basically just flushing your hard-earned dollars down the toilet? Well. I was really curious to see what the situation around timeshares is, so that's what we're talking about today. So let's just dive right into it. So what is a timeshare exactly, and what's the history surrounding them? I think that's a pretty good place to start. The earliest timeshares actually started in Europe in the 1960s. The tourism industry was booming because of commercial air travel, so France and Switzerland were two of the first countries to debut vacation ownership packages. The French company, the Société des Grands Travaux de Marcel, sorry for butchering, began offering its timeshare product between 1964 to 1968. The resort offered by this Adventure company time. was a ski resort based in the French Alps called Super Dévoli. Their advertising slogan was, no need to rent the room, buy the hotel, it's cheaper. The Swiss company, also known for founding timeshares, was called Habemag and was based in Bar, Switzerland. Shortly after founding the company in September 1963, Habemag's owner, Alexander Nett, and his associate, Guido Fengli, began buying resort properties in Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. Happenmag offered its members an extensive resort selection on a right-to-use basis instead of deeded ownership. Happenmag still enjoys timeshare success today and has remained independent of the largest exchange companies. Now, although Wikipedia states that the first U.S. timeshare was in 1974 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I've seen other sources say that it was actually on the island of Maui in Hawaii in 1969. The point is, they've been around for a while. Adventure time! It's cheaper to buy the hotel than the room slogan has been around for some time. Adventure time! Obviously, it's not true. I can grab a room in a decent hotel near me for less than 200 bucks a night. You can't buy a hotel for a few hundred bucks. I don't need a source for that. That one's just facts. But this idea appealed to a lot of people, ownership rather than renting. It's why owning a home is preferable to renting an apartment for so many. 
And don't get me wrong, there's property taxes, insurance, you have to handle it if something breaks, but when you own a house, it's part of your assets, you can sell it one day, and there's a bit more freedom in having your own space. So, needless to say, these companies starting to sell timeshares were working off of that appeal. Wouldn't it be nice to own a place in France for cheap, rather than rent when you're there sort of thing? But, of course, with a timeshare, you don't really own any property, simply the right to be there. As Investopedia puts it, a timeshare is a shared ownership model of vacation real estate in which multiple purchasers own allotments of usage, typically in one-week increments, in the same property. The timeshare model can be applied to many different types of properties, such as vacation resorts, condominiums, apartments, and campgrounds. Sometimes there's fixed week models where a buyer has a set week each year, or a floating week where the use of the property is limited to a season, or rotating or flex weeks, then weeks are rotated backwards or forwards through a calendar. You kind of get the picture here. Even though this type of ownership really isn't for me, especially because I don't have a set work routine, so knowing my schedule in advance is nearly impossible, this just isn't what really bothers me. Yeah. 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 And just trying to get out of here. So this is the Wind rises. I guess they're technically so stupid, but they're really scary. There's a plenty of things that they will talk about this I can't address all of that, but I want to get a pretty clear picture of the stereotypical dimension of this system. They tend to fall apart and it's all pretty cookie cutter, and they've got to see them definitely really close to this. Well, it's pretty similar with these time shows. It's more curious. It was readiness for the power of music. It's so good to give them a few hundred dollars worth of time. It's just not too big to make a bank. That's far enough. But unfortunately, it's a great dinner. Yes, I know you have. I'm all for it. However, timeshares, as the article states, are ultimately an impulse purchase. People don't typically go on vacation with the goal of buying a timeshare. Once someone gets their free dinners, they're out. So the salesperson has to focus on closing. Jacob Jacoby said, the first hint of this came from the Ford building free breakfast. Our salesperson started out by stating that we were under no obligation to buy anything. He then added that he only wanted us to buy if we absolutely loved what you're about to see. Sounded fair and reasonable. But then he asked us a series of highly manipulative questions, including, do you like taking vacations? Why do you like taking vacations? Are taking family vacations important to you? If I could show you how to save money on your vacations, would you be interested? Of course, these questions weren't being asked to help us understand our own needs better or enable the salesperson to develop valuable insights into our problems. These questions were obviously designed to trap buyers into agreeing that they should take more vacations. Taking vacations is something that's good for their family. And that being a timeshare owner could save them money. After briefly showing us the timeshare property, the conversation shifted to closing. For the next hour, we were trapped in a conference room while our salesperson tried his best to close us. First, he used a few trial closes, such as, have I presented you with enough information to make a decision? Despite my negative responses, our salesperson nevertheless kept pushing forward, trying to close us on the expensive timeshare option. When that didn't work, he offered us progressively cheaper options. I stood my ground, firmly rejecting each option. At this point, the salesperson berated me for not taking advantage of such a great opportunity to lock up a lifetime of quality family vacations and try to close again. And this is a common thing among timeshare salespeople. Hey, do you want some free stuff? Just give me an hour of your time. Then you're stuck giving them hours and hours when they push a hefty, long-term purchase down your throat. At least with an MLM, even if you're pressured into buying the starter kit, you can toss that in the trash and quit the next day. But not only is this a horrible way to do business because of the aggressive nature, it's just not addressing anyone's needs or wants either. Absolutely ignoring what comes out of someone's mouth to try and make a sale? Yeah, that sounds like all the hunts we talk about in multi field businesses. Even though this experience sounds frustrating, it's far from the nightmares one people seem to describe either. And I'm just going to deviate here for just a moment because I've actually done one of these little pitch, so let me tell you a little bit about what happened when I got put through the ringer on this. So this was many years ago when I went to Las Vegas with a boyfriend for just like a little getaway. We were walking down the main part of the strip and there's someone that approached us and was like, hey, we'll give you like $100 of free dinners if you just come listen to us in like an hour. 
so we were like sure we've got like an hour to kill no big deal so they pulled us aside they took like some of our initial information and then we got put into this like stretch limo and taken away to somewhere far down on the edge of the strip and we got to walk around like the and stuff that they were obviously going to try and hard sell us on and it was just honestly not super impressive so i was already like yeah this is gonna suck Come at me, i was like yeah we're already here so i guess we're gonna go through this so they tried to sell you on this thing and i forgot how much it was but all i remember is that they wanted like a 25 or 40 thousand dollar deposit just to do a room in vegas for like once a week at like this hotel that was super cross strip like where nothing made sense there was nothing fun there like i'll just pay like a hundred dollars more every time i go not have to pay a 20 or 40 thousand dollar deposit for a room that's far away from anything and just, i'll put it that way and just take the hotel and every, like, every detail every time i go and I can tell you, these guys, when they try to close on you, this is some aggressive behavior. And this is coming from someone who used to sell cars, right? I used to put other people through the ringer to a degree. But never anything like this what I experienced. It was absolutely insane the way they try to corner you into these rooms and they'll bring in, like, their super manager. They'll be like, look at these people across the way in this other room. They're just signing on this amazing room. You could be like this, too. But I did persevere with my partner at the time, and after we left, it was kind of funny. So the $100 of gift cards or whatever, it was coupons for, again, some weird restaurant. It wasn't for anything interesting, so we never even used it, so we kind of, that got lost. And then for all, like, the rejects or whatever that didn't sign into the little timeshare deal, you got put back on this bus that they had Good no deeds. air conditioning on. And this is and when I went to Vegas in, like, the middle of the summer, and they had no the air end. conditioning on the bus. Like, it just made you feel all so, will be placed so on the scales. So that was my one and only experience with timeshares. And unfortunately, from what I've heard and what we're going to continue hearing, this is pretty normal. So if you ever get someone asking you for, like, an hour to go hear their timeshare shit or whatever, do not do it. All right, so now let's continue to some of the worst experiences that other people have had with timeshares. Kipling had published an article in December 2018 that said hours-long pressure-filled timeshare encounters leave two couples in tears. They write, if you tend to speak like a two-year-old, then every word uttered is no. Then it's probably safe for you to attend a timeshare presentation. But for anyone else, the chance at a free lunch or theme park tickets may not be worth spending hours of Who's your time next to sales pitches such as, it's a great investment which will increase in value, beat ever-increasing hotel rates, yield family fun, and can be left to your heirs. A couple was in their mid-70s, Dale, a Vietnam vet, Chivalry will never die. Adams, and his wife, June, who has dementia. They had owned a Vegas timeshare for several years, but seldom were able to use it as the dates they wanted were almost always booked up, Dale said. Finally, they got lucky and a room was available. When checking into their timeshare hotel, they asked if there was a way to lower the $2,500 yearly maintenance fee. They were directed to speak with Alex, a sales representative. It was the beginning of a nightmare where they were mentally and seemed physically held captive for Luck hours, they said. can swing the results of a single hours, game, they were yelled at, not even allowed but to it's bound to run out. Until purchased a new timeshare for over ten thousand dollars including closing costs of twenty eight hundred dollars put on a credit card which i kept telling them we did not want they all told us tearfully do these things happen you better believe it morse director of operations at resort release says adding that the elderly and people in poor health are often targets they are terrified of getting up and walking out they are truly paralyzed with fear this may not be everyone's experience with timeshares. I'm not saying if you've been to a fantastic presentation, then you're absolutely the odd one out. It does happen, I'm sure. But the hard spell is still used frequently because it works. It's all on the topic of timeshares and can board members. We're not the best judge of other people's sense of humor. Has anything changed? Are timeshares still sold? Okay, see? They say that the interview boundaries won't be sort of. The industry is self governing with the efforts of making progress. I hear everything. Some developers promote all the insurance programs and transparency to ensure that they are adequately informed about their possible purchase. To improve the consistency of their messaging, many companies are using theatrical using high tech tools, including videos, internet presentations, and tablets to educate owners and potential buyers about the benefits of spending an estimated $25,000 per week on their entire some independents will now still rely on traditional and high pressure features, really getting the best Invent teamwork and teamwork! Let's light it up! While buyers are the best, many still feel intimidated by the sales experience. Why do companies still rely on the best? Because it works. Okay, that's fantastic that some of you are 
I applaud that, and I hope it happens more. It's just the high-pressure salespeople in this situation use that I have the most problem with, especially given how they target those that seem to need the money the most, the elderly and those in poor health. A lot of you watching this may not fall into those categories, but for those that do, having finances for medical bills, for retirement, that's important. And taking advantage of those that have dementia or are more vulnerable than most is stunning. One couple featured on CBS Los Angeles even says they were offered $450 for a 90-minute presentation that turned into eight hours. They waited because they wanted the $450, and after six hours of constant pressure, they were offered alcohol. Why'd you drink this? I was thirsty. And sure, they drank it because they were thirsty, but isn't it funny how they weren't offered water? Yeah, it's just the salespeople trying to get them drunk and be a little more pliable. They were initiating and signing, easily swayed after hours and hours of not drinking, not eating, exhausted. Well, it's no wonder they were out of it so fast. The couple tried to cancel, but then the collection call started, threatening legal action. Not to mention, one saleswoman said they only serve alcohol as a celebration, despite an ex-salesman admitting that alcohol was brought to potential buyers without them asking for it before anything was in writing. As if pressuring someone wasn't enough, now these salespeople are knowingly signing up drunk buyers at tens of thousands of dollars. You do whatever it is you need to do to get the sale. Rick Pons, a former timeshare salesman, even wrote a book detailing these shady tactics called Lying for a Living. In his book, Pond's Diagram a typical hard sell timeshare operation. It starts Body with a person enough. called the liner, who is often the first to make contact with the target. At this stage of the presentation, the liner's main responsibility is to show the couples a good time, Pond says. You do this during the breakfast and the tour that follows, while at the same time you obtain as much information about them as you can. Pond says very often a couple will establish good rapport with the first members of the sales team, but will abruptly sour on the individual during the close. That's when others are sent in to salvage the sale and they take no prisoners using tactics Pond's names as pitting the couple against each other, humiliation, pity, and promising the unit will pay for itself by renting it out. Pond makes it clear that he is not painting all timeshare operators with the same brush. The bad ones, he says, will lie about almost anything. Pond says they will even lie about whether or not they are a timeshare, which he says has now become a loaded term that no one likes to use anymore. Instead, they may be called vacation clubs, all-inclusive clubs, or fractional ownership clubs. Hans believes the timeshare industry, after some 40 years, is being forced to evolve. With competition from newer, higher-quality resorts, the worst players are dropping by the wayside. Still, when you're on vacation, better to keep your guard up. Again, it's awesome that many of these bad ones are starting to drop, but they're not gone completely. This is still something to be aware of, because if something sounds too good to be true, like getting paid over $400 to listen to someone talk, well, it probably is. Now it's time to shift gears to start talking about the contracts and what happens if you do get stuck in a timeshare. But before we get into that, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor. We've all got goals in life, to be healthy, find a work-life balance, improve our friendships, but have you thought about your hair goals? Well, Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. First, you take a quick quiz to tell them a little bit about your hair type, your goals, such as lengthening, volumizing, or oil control. For example, I said that I have straight hair and I really want to work on moisturizing since I live in Colorado and it is a very dry climate here. Then and after that, you choose your color and your fragrance. And I chose like the teal colors. Well, I think not. they're like listed as like the new ones because I just thought they were really aesthetic for summer. And I also chose the peach scent because Time to peach act. Scent is, like I love peach scent. So I was like, that's an easy guess. And then that's really it. They ship it off, deliver it to your door, and it shows up. And that's it. It was super easy. And every ingredient in Function of Beauty is vegan and cruelty-free, and they never use sulfates or parabens. And you can go completely silicone-free with an option as well, too. So if you want to get started today with Function of Beauty, make sure you go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take the quiz and save 20% off your mother's order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products. Again, go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know we sent you and get 20% off your first order. Function of Beauty slash casket so the question remains what happens if you do actually sign that contract and you get stuck in a timeshare well that's the next factor for this whole mess and how they're nearly impossible to get out of 
or at least a major headache. If you just look on Google at how to get out of a timeshare, one of the first results is from Money.US News, which recommends calling the developer, renting it out, selling it, and expecting to take a hit, gifting it, stop your payments, but obviously expect constant. Seriously, your options are to now harass someone to buy it from you while in parentheses they say expect to take a hit, rent it, give it away, or stop payments, which has a whole host of consequences, or avoid the scam you fell for in the first place. If you get into a bad lease, sure, it absolutely sucks, but at least a lease is typically a year long. Timeshare contracts can be five years, indefinite, 99 years, or more. Many are at least 20 years. Hell, even Allie, who's been helping me with this video, says her fiance is still receiving mail about a deceased family member's timeshare that died over 10 years ago. USA Today wrote that in late 2018, that timeshares are far more difficult to escape than you might think. Even if this industry is getting better, this article is still super recent, so it shows it's not improving fast enough. Here's what it says. Getting into a timeshare is easy. Getting out isn't. Kathy Asaro knows that. She recently decided that her Rancho Mirage California timeshare, which she paid off years ago, wasn't worth keeping. It didn't fit my lifestyle, says Asaro, a retired sales manager from Foster City, California. Just one problem. There was no way out. Her contract, like most timeshare agreements, had a perpetuity clause. When she phoned the timeshare company to request that it take back her unit, a representative cheerfully informed her that she was stuck with her condo and the $1,300 in annual maintenance fees forever. If she failed to pay her maintenance fees, the company politely threatened to report her to a credit agency. She's not alone. A University of Central Florida study found that 85% of timeshare owners who go to contract regret their purchase. That's a lot of unhappy timeshare owners. And lately, they've been asking me if those perpetuity clauses are really forever. They're not. Getting out of a timeshare is considerably more difficult than getting in, says Lisa Ann Schreider, author of the book Timeshare Vacations for Dummies. But it's possible. First, a reality check. No one wants you to be unhappy with your timeshare, especially the timeshare industry. We want to ensure that timeshare owners have the option to exit their timeshare in a safe and transparent Time to place. Ask. Peter Roth, a spokesperson for the American Rain outlines your paint. Nip that in the park. The industry is almost the exact opposite of the UCS study, suggesting 85% of all timeshare owners are happy with their purchases. If you're among the 15% who want Because, hey, who wants to leave freaking Hawaii, right? 
So when someone puts it on as a vacation club, it makes it sound as you'll be able to go there much more often and it'll be cheaper or whatever the hell they're trying to say. It may be technically legal apart from the being drunk part, but it's a shitty way to do business. You aren't really investing in anything because timeshares depreciate in value, just like a car, and it's incredibly rare that they increase. They don't generate income. It's not like owning a vacation property or real estate. There's a substantial amount of fraud in the resource industry. The market's flooded and more are being built all the time. The gifts, the tickets, the gambling chips, whatever the hell it is that someone offers, it's just not worth it, at least in my opinion. There's even been lawsuits as recent as March 2020 against timeshare owners, such as Wyndham Vacation Resorts, for lying to buyers in sales presentations. Filed in Delaware, the 26-page suit alleges specifically that Wyndham has used consistently deceptive and misleading sales practices to pressure consumers in Nevada and Tennessee into signing contracts with the company. The lawsuit claims consumers are repeatedly lied to by Wyndham sales representatives during lengthy sales presentations that take up to six or seven hours and are told they will save those money who by becoming time around. share owners and enjoy That's what they a busy anyway. array of choices. Oh, my luck. The case the alleges, opposite. however, that the opposite is true. Wyndham sales representatives fail to disclose certain fundamental aspects of the company's timeshare program, including that $15,000 to $25,000 worth of timeshare points sold by Wyndham could be resold on eBay.com for as little as $1, that timeshare owners would often be forced to book vacations over a year in advance due to persistent availability issues at desired Wyndham resort locations. That ever-increasing annual maintenance fees would eventually cause the overall value of some owners' timeshares to fall below zero, and that Wyndham properties were often cheaper and more readily available through public websites such as TripAdvisor.com. Stressing the last point, the lawsuit alleges that Wyndham has intentionally and consistently failed to disclose the prospective buyers that through public vacation booking websites, they can often travel to the same destination with greater flexibility and without spending the average cost of $21,000 to become a timeshare owner. I could go on and on. These allegations are rampant, but as it turns out, Wyndham has been sued before. A 2015 Red Week article said that two recent legal cases, one in Wisconsin, the other in Tennessee, may give timeshare owners hope there is indeed a light at the end of their timeshare tunnel. As these cases show, sometimes the little guys, rank and file timeshare owners, actually win a case against big brand name resort developers. In the Wisconsin case, the Wyndham timeshare chain, the largest publicly owned timeshare company in the world, agreed to pay $665,404 in restitution to 29 owners as part of a court-approved settlement announced May 29th by the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. And seriously, do these companies ever learn? They were sued in 2015, lost, and had to clear records with credit companies and pay restitution. Yet, they're still getting sued again a few years later. They're pushy, they do not learn from their mistakes, and it only gets worse the more you look into it. Apparently, even scheduling your allotted time has been difficult in the past. Hard enough that misrepresentations about the ease of scheduling have led to states passing laws to outlaw these deceptive statements. And you can't count on renting it out either, depending on your contract. And facing timeshare foreclosure if payments are late is a whole separate beast entirely. Overall, taking a look at this, I don't really see a benefit. Who wants to pay for a room in advance that's worth far less than what you're paying for? I know that for 15% of people that buy them, they don't regret it. But a 15% customer satisfaction rating is abysmal, and it says a lot about how this whole damn industry operates. It's supposedly getting better, but it needs to hurry up because a lot of these articles weren't exactly old. So with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode on timeshares with the corporate casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening to this so that you can stay up to date on all the most recent episodes whenever those go live. And if you want to connect with me outside of here, make sure to go to the description box and look for my Linktree link, and it'll give you all the links to various projects that I work on, my social media, all that good stuff. Thank you guys for tuning in to another Corporate Casket. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!
familiar sight. Surprise, I'm rolling again. God! Yes! I'm gonna be kissed you. What? What the? What? What? Bro, what? Today, we are all scientists. Say it with me. You and me, we're scientists. And it's not just for polling. But why are we scientists, you ask? What are we testing today? Today, we're here to see if getting five stars and rolling in Genshin does in fact increase your heart rate to hopefully not unhealthy levels. That was my original plan. But my friend Ant was using hot sauce in one of his uh, streams and he, he, he gave me the brilliant idea to also use hot sauce in my streams. You're probably wondering how did he include hot sauce? Sport rolling. That doesn't make sense. You can't put hot sauce on a five star. But you can take hot sauce if you lose something. So every time we lose a 50 50 for a viewer, which is going to be very unfortunate, so which I hope I never do, we will take one of the spiciest hot sauces in the world. And for comparison, spicy levels are measured in something called Go Bills. And let's 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 think of a hot Cheeto. Hot Cheeto. Everyone knows what a hot Cheeto is, right? It's a, it's a Cheeto that's spicy. And it's pretty good. A flaming hot Cheeto is right. Is around 50,000 Scoville units, but it, it, it's not big compared to the hot sauce we're taking. The, the ghost pepper hot sauce we're taking today is over 1 million Scoville heat level. And unfortunately, I will not be pouring the hot sauce on my own uh, chicken nuggets that I will be eating it with. I'm allowing my roommate, Ant, to pour the amount of hot sauce that will be on the chicken nugget that I will eat if I do lose a 50-50. So, Subscribe, because it's about to get spicy. Now, if you've seen one of my older videos, I have had the spiciest chip in the world. It's okay, Jake. You're a brave soldier for doing the challenge less than three. I'm a idiot that's what i am so I, I feel like i feel like i can handle most things now but check this out this is our heart rate monitor looks like this it'll be strapped to my chest it is strapped on right here now where's the heartbeat jake i i can't see the heart rate well there you go all right the first account is actually one of my discord mods her name is jubilee and their message was is i'm aiming for just one yoramiya con but i'm on a 50 50 so we'll see lamau all right. You know what? The thing that sets the entire luck, foreshadows the entire video, is if I win the first 50-50. Oh, 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 she here. How to, leave her there? She wants to help. Oh, I see. Hello. Any words of encouragement? I have speed one. Oh, okay. 50-50, and we have 100 rolls. First time. Good deeds. It's all part of the job, you know? This is what I do for a living. Let's get this, come on. Come on, we, we know what we're here for. All will be placed upon the scale. 20! I'm at 115! Why is my heart rate so high? Dude, I'm gonna lower my heart rate with my mind. Hold on. Why is it going up? I give up. Oh, they're chanting Yo I Mia. Mean, can I get a Yo Mia chant? 72! Come on, this isn't for me, chat. This is for a viewer. This is one of you guys. Think about the people. Don't think about me, some filthy whale. 77! I got my heart rate, my heart rate, chill, 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 my heart rate, chill, chill. That's for you, Jubilee. Yeah. We don't lose. Thank you. Jesus Christ. I won. What do you mean? But it's bound to All right, Jubilee soon. says, thank you. You can use the rest of the wishes if you want, though. No. I already logged out. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I already logged out. You will not. I already logged out. All right, our next contestant. I asked them if they're ready, and they said they're nervous. Understandable. But no reason to be nervous when I'm in charge. I win my 50-50s. They have a wishing spot, they said. And my friend is there for mental support. All right, is this the wishing spot? All right, well, let's sit next to our friend's right here. And, uh, whip out the wishing banner. You want Yomir and her weapon. 37 is my pity. And we're at a 50-50. Okay! Wait, they just said I have to win seven 50-50s. 57! A book. This is 67, right? Never oh mind, man. Your calculator. I got two bennies. 76. I'm not. I'm kind of worried. Nah, see? Listen, I lied. I'm not worried. I win them. I don't lose. I don't lose. All right, you want me to check? Two 50 50s in a row. One. We want the thundering pulse. Our pity is. Oh. We're using the rest for a thundering pulse. Uh, two four stars. That's that's a good sign, right? I don't know if we get the ball. I'm gonna be real. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get it. You gonna get it here? 
you get it, I will eat the hot sauce. Okay, if I don't get it, what happens? We double the hot sauce. That's not happening. <laughs> Ow! We released you on Crypt. Alright, I'm sorry, Cloudy. Unfortunately, we were not able to get a bow, but we did win the 50-50. That's the hardest part about pulling for a character. Alright, next contestant, d -Lowy. They said, well, they copy and pasted the fitness gram page of test, so I'm not gonna read that out, but you can imagine what they said. I, I said, I texted them, alright, you're next. And they said, I'm gonna throw up Lamau. <laughs> what the? Dude, what the? Nah, what the hell was that? I have 66 wishes and I'm going for Thundering Pulse. I'm at 16 pity. Okay, easy enough, I suppose. I'm at 87. See, look, I'm so calm now. What is your rest in I don't know. This why? It's not really 50-50. It's not, it's not really fair to call this a 50-50. Winners don't make excuses, Jay. And you know what you are right now? Nah, you are a demotivator. I am motivated. Don't make excuses, just win. Okay, I'll win. Watch me win the third ring pulse right now. Watch, go. Nope. Shinyan in a book. Here we go. This is it. Uh huh. I'll go get the chicken. Nah, this this is a count. It's a count, bro. You said, listen, no pressure, but I got two Jade Spears during Yelan's banner. The only thing he gets is Jade Spears. Nah. It's not done yet. I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not done. I have 16 more wishes. Ready? You lost the whole. <laughs> Wait. Do I still go? Yes, keep going. Oh, okay. If, if there's a god out there, if, and if someone is out there for me, looking after me, now is the time to just, like, do some crazy stuff right now. Right now! Eloi, I apologize. You did your best. Thank you, Lamal. <sighs> You know, it's because you're here. You need to get out of my room. Oh. I'm not happy. <laughs> Shut the... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here we go. This is, uh... That's how much sauce is on? Decent amount. No, That's a decent amount. Re right. Reminder, this is, uh... Over a million Scoville. And comparison again. Ha hot cheeto. Guess how much your hot cheeto is. Oh. It's 50,000. Oh. Hot cheeto's a lie. Alright, here we go. It already hurts. I need milk. And use your prime subs, guys. Ah! My heart rate's 120! It's burning! 120, can we get 130? <laughs> Sorry, do we have 130? <laughs> I don't do well with spice. <laughs> 100! I will not succumb. I, I will. I will. Ah! Okay, our next contestant. Howdy. They said, huge fan. Get me Thundering Pulse. Thanks, man. Of course. Hey, I know you. Chicken Bruno. In Victoria. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the stadium. I'm gonna eat it. Actually. So you want the hot sauce? No, I don't, because I'm not gonna lose another. Watch. Watch this. What did I say? 40. 40, baby. 40. Early. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Howdy, I don't know if you're watching, but if you are, I'm sorry. But I'm doing the best I can. I just need to do dailies. This one roll could save everything. It said she's crying right now. I, 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 um, it's okay. If you ever see me IRL, I'll wail on your account. Or I'll make her uncry with this one pull. She'll like reverse cry. I have to leave Cobb. This is the only way. One pull! One weapon! One drain! Proudy! Ah! Sorry, Audi. Forgive me for my failures in winning the 50 50. Shut the fuck up. So you can guess which hot sauce this is, I'll eat it with you. You changed the hot sauce? Did I? I don't know. You did it, it looks the same, it smells the same. Okay, so guess which one it is. It's the same. If you're wrong, you have to eat it. Okay, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. Am I right? You're wrong, it's four out of five. What? <laughs> I thought that- What? Why? What do you mean why? You're supposed to do the hottest. Oh, because I thought it would be funny if you had to eat it again. Cause One minute later. <clears throat> okay, 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm done. I wasn't even that bad. Yeah, okay, we're only doing the, we're only doing the hottest one for now. This is, you know, this is some pussy. Alright, next contestant, Tortellini. They said, I want Yo Mia so bad. I don't have a five star in this account. She's my dream character. Please, please, please. Wait, pause. They said they had a friend joining. Hello. Don't lose this for her. No. I don't know why, but the pressure is so much more today than any other rolling session I've ever done. Maybe it's because I have a heart rate monitor strapped to me as well as punishment waiting for me if I don't win. Okay, all we need is one Yoamiya, right? And we don't have a single five star. They said, if you lose, I blame Ant. Good choice. Wow, okay, so our pity is 10. No time for stories. Only time for rules. Thirty. Sixty. Seventy. Two four stars. Seventy one. Seventy two. Okay. We're on here. Seventy nine. They said, why is Yomiya using a claymore? Um... <laughs> they said it's all ants fault. No, 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 Oh, this is your daily reminder. If you're on YouTube, hit that red uh, subscribe button, hit that like button, turn the notification bell on. He's currently dying of hot sauce. If you appreciate him for that, make sure you subscribe. Also, make sure to check me out at youtube.com forward slash g forward slash Nick. you. Okay, back on with the rest of the video. I'll be back. I'm getting BTSD. Oh. This is not okay. Oh, you opened another one? Yeah, I opened another one. Yeah, I did, dude. Chat, I did not do well with spice. That... Ah, look at what this dude gave me. The f*** am I gonna do with this? It's bad for my teeth to bite it. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you emo! <laughs> what? What am I supposed to do? You like it. Nah. I'm not losing anymore! 50-50! No more! I've had enough! I'm logging against the next contestant. Their message for me is, Hi, Dad. I've been waiting for you and me to come back. Oh, dude. Are you serious? Okay, no! Hi, Dad. Been waiting for you and me to come back since your first banner 2.0. We're too excited to get it. Okay, no negative thoughts. Cleanse your thoughts, chat. Today, tonight. Okay. A familiar sight. Yes! Come on! Yes! I won! I'm back, baby! That's what I'm talking about! And I'm out! I'm done! The rest can go in the character man. Yes? For content? They said it, not me. Everything to y'all, Mia. 61 is our baby. 61. Alright, here we go. This is my redemption arc. Yes! Yes! Again! Come on! Come on! I'm back, baby! Oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Next, next five stars guaranteed. We, do we want C two? We go again. We have the green light. Nice pull. Yun Jin. Yes! Come on! What the? What? What? Bro! What? You can't make us up! I'm back! I'm back, baby! I'm back! what I say, chat? what I say? Yo, if you're watching this far on YouTube, you made it to the redemption arc! That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking oh. about. Oh, I thought I, I thought I saw a five star for a sec. No yeah, bro. No kid. I smell it. It's coming. It's coming. 
It took almost dying from various hot sources and ants popsicle to bring the luck back. Yeah, baby, we're back. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I got three! They said, thank you so much, I love you. And I love you, random citizen. Now, Mario, congrats on your cons and your Yunjin cons as well. Should I, should I just finish? Do the last 10? They said do the last 10. Okay, sure, I'll do the last 10. What could go wrong? Bennett. Yunjin again. Wow. Okay. And that's it. Boy! Last but not least, I only have around 22 bitty and 6,000 primos. But I wouldn't mind a Skyward Harp or an Amos bow. Thank you, Mr. Quanto. Have a beautiful day. Are we ending? Are we ending this with the hardest challenge? Winning the 50 50 on a weapon banner? We've been, we've been through so much, guys. We've been through so much. Now we're ending. Okay. One primer impulse. One five star. 22 bitty. Come on. This is the last. The last challenge! Come on! Dude, I think there's a five star right here. I do it on one account. I have to do it on all the accounts. Do it for the last guy. This is a pack. Well, it's not for me. From a very kind viewer, Argent and Heart donated a hundred dollars so that the last person could make sure they get one more chance at a five-star weapon. Wow! What a beautiful world we live in! Not everyone's going home happy, but this last contestant definitely gets one more shot at it. All right, here we go. Run it back. We're pushing for a bow. Can we get a happy ending? I'm gonna do so much. Yeah. I'm gonna do so much. Another one, a hundred dollars. Our gentle, your soul is too kind just to make sure it's last. Oh, this isn't our last contestant. I lied. I. That's, that's, this is not our last contestant. God, how did I get this part? How did I not? Hey, Dumbo, I'm so sorry, bro. What the? How did I? Well, at least this person getting a happy ending. How did I miss someone? Okay, I skipped over them because their message was so small. And then they just said, they sent me a message. Was this the last person who didn't go into my account list? I'm so sorry, Dennis. Why is the weapon banner such a card? Yes! Can we get out of here? I don't want to do this anymore. It's really the last contestant. Your message to us is poggers. How can I miss such a message? Okay, so we have 21,000 primers. We want C3 Yonia and another cover. Okay, this is officially the last. I lost about how many 50 50s? 3. So I have to do a fat pot stocks. One Yonia, one Thunder and Pulse. Check Kitty, I don't, I don't want to. I've given up. I'm just. I know we're gonna win it. I'm just confident. I'm so confident, I know we don't need to win the city. I've been through the worst. I've rolled on a weapon banner. The weapon banner, character banner, is nothing compared to the weapon banner, okay? Nothing. The character banner, easiest banner in the world. Oh, my bad. Got a good thing. I saw. 
Oh man, okay. Alright guys, it's time to pull something out of here. Oh, they don't want to do it anymore? Did they do the weapon banner? If you can, go into my teapot and go to the third island. Oh, good, Cat. Let him use strength. Oh my god. Oh my god, this might be the worst rolling session of all time. I am never rolling with Ant ever again. Oh, dude. Dude, are you seeing this right now? You see how much I've been rolling? This is kind of good. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Stop, watch. Look, watch. Watch. Let's light it up. That's what I thought. Alright, all right. up and damage! Get back in! Okay, do we continue with Yomia? Do we continue with Yomia? What you say? Sure, it's guaranteed to go for it. Early? Sorry to those that lost the 50 50 farm and the weapon banner. What makes you feel better, I will suffer in your lack of pain. Good luck, Jay. I'm a pussy! <laughs> okay! is a very unique and important person in this world. He is someone who has a very loud voice and a very big platform. There are accusations that have come out against David Dobrik, Jason Nash, and Conan, uh, the general group called the Blood Club. It is kind of like a cult. It's like a cult. How do I, if I need to make a blood oath, do I need to sacrifice something, I will win. It just felt like really demonic energy. He had such a tight rule on that whole party. We know who we are, we know our character, we know we're good people, and we know it's not true. Stop. <laughs> From an entertainment perspective, they do a great job of entertainment. I mean, the numbers obviously prove that. But just because you're popular doesn't mean you're, like, a good person. He's swinging around on the excavator. David Dobrik's driving it, being irresponsible, slams into the thing. He's spinning it way too fast. Of course, he comes back, slams the thing. When you're a creator like David, Let's where the set the begins and ends is really blurry. But it is your set. You know, you do have to take responsibility for the environment you're creating on set. Always come up to us and they're like, I'll, I'll, I'll make out with whoever for the vlog, <laughs> uh, and, it's, and it gets scary. What if they were humans which are so willing to sexually do something to be a yeah. part of something? I don't know what it is, but I, <laughs> I, I regret making that thing. <laughs> Welcome to Site IRL, my name is Donna. I want to start this video with a disclaimer. Every time I do a video similar to this one, I get emails and DMs stating that I'm teaching manipulation or it's dangerous. Although it can be taken that way and many groups have used it in that sense, these techniques have also been used positively to treat addiction, cope with trauma, etc. So the methods themselves are neutral, but individuals are the ones who either take them in a negative or positive direction. Some are even used in sales. You could put three bodies in it. 
At the end of the day, though, you can also take these techniques and protect yourself from anyone who may use them against you. Also, I have no idea how well the algorithm will treat this video because we will be talking and discussing controversial cults. So I don't normally ask this, but please share it and give this video a like. Okay, so the majority of the theories from this video will be based on the book Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan, as we examine how to control a group with the vlog squad as an example. Is everyone exaggerating when they equate David Dobrik's ensemble to a cult, or is there something more to it? The surge of drama pertaining to popular YouTuber David Dobrik has brought up discussions of weird practices and group dynamics pertaining to the ensemble called the Vlog Squad. The Vlog Squad is a group of content creators best known for their extreme stunts, pranks, and giveaways. Dobrik is usually classified as the mastermind of the group, seeing as he is often behind these extreme ideas. The YouTuber also surpasses his counterparts in terms of follower count. The public opinion has been effectively split down the middle in what constitutes normal behavior and expectations when joining such a group. On one side, you have those who call out the blog squad for cultish behavior, and on the other, you have those who see the behavior as routine in a group such as this one. I think skepticism of this group is warranted. There are too many former members who've had bad experiences with Dobrik and the Vlog Squad. Ultimately, you don't see scandals like this coming out of Vsauce. By perhaps analyzing the systemic structure of cults, we can determine if the accusatory info of David Dobrik is an overblown hit piece or a dark and hidden truth to a brand-friendly organization. Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you? give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you. Don't you want to become a cult leader? It would kind of be impossible for me, a third party, to confirm or deny the classification of the blog squad as a cult. The other day you gave me some advice. You told me how to take my music career to the next level, and I decided to take that advice. Am I getting a face tattoo? I was kidding. Did you get a face tattoo? I did. <laughs> Oh, thank God. You scared me. Right here. <laughs> Obviously, members and former members have access to information outside individuals cannot obtain. What we can do is examine the information that has been released publicly from former and current members and infer if the vlog squad has similar characteristics to these organizations. Are you Jesus? I am Jesus, yes. <laughs> Although I do not think Dobrik had intentions of assembling a cult, the environment the group was in are the perfect conditions for one to thrive. I was in this hospital one time visiting my aunt and I remember looking out the window and thinking how strange it was that a building for the Church of Scientology was directly across from the hospital. I later learned how ideal this was for the church and that the location and environment play an important role in cult recruitment. In a survey of present and former cult members, data indicates that a majority of people being recruited were approached at a vulnerable time of stress in their lives, starting a new job, breaking off a new relationship, experiencing financial instability, or losing a loved one. These parties prey on people's vulnerabilities and disguise themselves as an answer to these people's prayers. So here are a number of things that make this building's location prime for recruitment. Being in front of a hospital is optimal for finding those who are in a vulnerable time of stress in their lives. They are in danger of losing a loved one, or have. They may also be experiencing financial instability because of the unexpected costs of health care in the U.S. Even more ideal is that this building is located in Hollywood. The city attracts transients ready to make their acting dreams a reality. With this territory comes a number of vulnerabilities Scientology is ready to take advantage of. Transients are often starting a new job because of their move, breaking off relationships because of their move, and experiencing financial instability because of the move. When I was homeless, I was standing in line at Central Casting to be a background worker, right? And I was living in my car, and this Scientology guy approached me, and he's like, hey, this you can come and take these courses, and it'll help you with life and all that stuff, and uh, maybe we can help you find housing. And I was like, shit, I'll go. 
Scientology's manipulation is even more obvious as they will offer acting classes to unsuspecting transients. So in this advertisement, they'll say something such as this. How to break into the industry with TV actor Gino Montesinos. In this workshop, you'll find out how to get an agent, how to get a manager, how to get into Screen Actors Guild. So you may pay twenty to thirty dollars and go to this workshop, or you think you may be meeting a TV actor, a casting director, an agent, but really they are Scientologists, and it's going to be a very quick bait and switch to get you into the Church of Scientology signed up for a course. Aspiring actors will purchase these courses in hopes it will get them to where they want to be. It's no surprise that Scientology chooses. Uses California as its second best location to hold its real estate. The environment is prime for recruitment. The Vlog Squad's environment works in an eerily similar way. Most of the early members were former Vine stars looking to make a name for themselves on social media. This dynamic ticks off quite a few boxes in our vulnerability list. Most members aren't native to California, so moving into a house together is very similar to having a new job. When I was first got into the group, you know, I was like 22 years old. I just moved to LA. You know, I was just looking for a cool group of friends that I could kind of work with and collaborate with. That I can also be friends and also, you know, have some sort of other interesting activities going on with. And you know, that group, you know, they were they were cool people when I met, and I, and I liked what they were doing. In addition, the new move results in the difficulty. Of maintaining personal relationships with individuals from their hometown, romantic or platonic. The early days of a career in social media aren't lucrative since view count is inconsistent. This leads to financial instability. Yo, they're shutting down Vine. They will be shutting down. Vine is dead. Found out one point in the Vine was done. Like, what am I gonna do now? And we, we're all in the, we were all in the same boat. Thank God, David was there, like filming vlogs while it was happening because I honestly do not know where we would be right now. All these checked off boxes makes members more likely to comply with actions that could possibly get them out of their vulnerable state. These actions most likely include content for David Dobrik's blog. They make Jason make out with Seth, but Seth doesn't know that it's Jason. He thinks it's like a girl. Yeah, it, it's yeah. happened twice, okay? And so, and, and so any time like Jason will like hit or something, or like, no, he's not. And so like Jason will take off his mask or whatever, and he's like, what? The Wait, like, like, they, wait, 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 wait,
just be on, making sure you get you something to eat. I will. Don't worry. All right. Are you okay You're by yourself? You got the front door locked? Yep. All right. I will check on you. You want me to stop and get you something on my way home? Uh, sure. Probably like nine o'clock. I don't no really care what well, you get. It's rather yeah, pathetic to force a conversation okay. just to <laughs> occupy <laughs> silence. Or Sonic or something. I don't really care. Okay, sounds good. Alrighty. All right, love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. The value of knowledge cannot simply be quantified in monetary terms. Isaac Hoshi and Josh Peck being some examples. Log Squad member Corinna Kopp's evolution from vulnerable to not vulnerable is another example of this dynamic happening before your eyes. The earliest scenes of her in Dobrik's vlogs involve Corinna as the butt of shaving jokes and performing actions she wouldn't normally do if she were financially stable. I uh, decided that I'm kind of broke right now, so David said he'd help me out and I'm going to get a tattoo on my finger. It's going to say David's vlog. <laughs> he's saying the uh, small one's coming to do it. Corinna, what are you going to do now with your new tattoo? Are you going to show off to other people how stupid you are? The more established her career became, the less these bits were prevalent in Dobrik's internet videos. Traditional media faces similar problems because it mirrors this dynamic. Many are willing to partake in risky behavior for a chance of high reward. The difference is, over the years, many interns, writers, and up-and-coming actors have fought for laws to be passed in order to protect themselves. While Hollywood still has its shortcomings, the social media space is even more deregulated. 
Along with the natural environment the Vlog Squad is placed in, the internal structure of their work environment is very similar to that of a cult. The desire for these individuals to launch their entertainment industry careers inadvertently creates a work structure that is top-down. Destructive cults are often authoritarian and structurally top-down, with a single leader on top and a smaller inner circle immediately below. At, at present, Mr. Mr. Moon is regarded as a messiah. I shall be God. And yeah. inside me, there shall be no other. Yeah. I am the bliss of is to get their follower count up. Members naturally fall into place in this structure based on follower count. Members with the highest follower count are on top, while those with lower follower counts fall at the bottom. Reasonably so. This member can ask a lower ranked member to do something for their video because the lower ranked member will benefit through exposure, while the higher ranked member will benefit through low cost labor. What happens if it were the reverse? This lower ranked member asks the higher one to make a video. Well, there wouldn't be much incentive for the higher member to partake. They already have more exposure than the lower ranked member. This is why you rarely see Gilbert partaking in any humiliating scenes, even on his friend's vlogs. David never puts any value himself in the vlogs. Okay. Wait, you know what that do? It's great. He always puts something bad. Okay. Every time one of us does something that's a little bit weird, he always puts it in and then he cuts out everything he does. So, true. if we edited this vlog, it would look a lot different. Healthy organizations have in place a checks and balances system to prevent any individuals from taking over. Established workplaces have a human resources department. Laws are instituted like the Occupational Safety and Health Act to protect employees. Although this structure based on follower count isn't explicitly verbalized to Vlog Squad members, it's subconsciously followed due to members' desires to further their social media career. David Dobrik even addressed this in his second apology video. And I want to be able to have a place of checks and balances. I want to have HR. And I want to be able um, to have people communicate discomfort in a way that's, that's comfortable to them. On this channel, we paint Dobrik like a modern Frank Abagnale, able to persuade anyone with charisma and charm. These characteristics have been key in helping him climb the influencer ladder using tactics similar to Jake Paul, yet remaining a likable figure to viewers. Though helpful, charm and charisma are not enough to control a group. Think Tyrion Lannister versus Daenerys Targaryen. One can persuade those around him, while the other persuades a whole nation. How does a person actually gain control of a mass of people? And does Dobrik's ensemble fall into this trap? He was most interested in talking with me about his experience of shock at how easy it was to con people, how easy it was to manipulate them, how easy it was to get them to give up their money. What was so fascinating to him was that many of his followers were young adults and full-grown adults who had been very rebellious people. And here he found them so willing. Once he had conned them with his smooth talk, his soft sell, his, I'll love you forever, your mind will make this perfect new order. How easy to obey and do anything. In Edgar Sheen's book, Coercive Persuasion, the process can be done in three steps unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. If you've watched any cult documentary, you'll notice the organization living wildly tiresome lives. It seems counterintuitive when you want people to stay in the group, and yet, they do. But well, Gwen asked that we meditate at least once a day. There are like 108 different meditations that, that are available to do. And um, for us now, at this point on the ranch, work is our meditation. This is purposely done and refers to the step of unfreezing, which is disorienting an individual so they're more open to accepting a cult's new way of thinking. This can be done in a variety of ways, but the most common is through physiological means like sleep deprivation. Members of the Unification Church International eagerly participate in a special campaign to clean up a very dirty New York City.
Many are also fed low protein and high sugar diets or starve. Several papers back this method. For instance, when one is hungry, they are more likely to make brash decisions. Although I don't think Dobrik does this on purpose, the hustle lifestyle of trying to make it in Hollywood certainly causes people to live in such a way where unfreezing unconsciously occurs. <laughs> Your hours aren't set like they might be in a traditional workplace. You're constantly overworking in hopes of making a name for yourself. Meanwhile, you may even be taking a part-time job so you can eat and pay rent. While the person is being broken down, they are often bombarded with ideas that they are seriously flawed. If you can imagine my excitement when my grandfather took the school report and read it to the 500 members of my community at dinner. And then he said, we don't want women like you. My stomach dropped. I turned bright red. There was air being sucked in my nostrils, but I couldn't breathe. See, my school teacher had written in my report a sentence that read, Lilia demonstrates leadership skills, which could be useful for when she's older. And my grandfather, humiliated me for hours and this would become a common thing throughout my life sure bits on dobrik's channel are framed as jokes but they always take a life of their own outside the vlog we both got this for you we've kind of pitched in Mike, right, come out nick look i got you a girlfriend <laughs> Kidding me? Another door? Look at this. Yes. This is Christine. This is Hi, Big Nick. Nick. Oh, that's adorable. Not everything has to do with doors. Like I just want you to look at me like a normal person. It also got to a point where people would recognize me in public, and then they would make jokes like about me, and I'm like, dude, like I don't know you. It seems like your time in the vlog squad they made you the butt of the joke a lot, and yeah, that and, probably and started to bother to... you, you know, and and like it's like right, everybody right. all of a sudden not giving you any respect. Once these flaws are internalized, they may be used as blackmail or a preventative measure to keep one in the cult. Here you see Jeff Wittick hint at dirt he has on a former member who shared his perspective of being in Dobrik's crew. I know Big Nick came on here and I mean, like, again, I don't I don't want to have fucking problems with Big Nick. But um, yeah, he was uh, he was caught doing some sketchy stuff and i'll just tell you the story we had like an easter egg hunt vlog on uh you see now i feel like a rat right when dobrik released his second apology this former member conveniently says he accepts the apology now obviously no one knows the truth except for them but one can't help be suspicious because of this exchange the next steps to gaining control of an individual is changing. Once a person is broken down, it's time for their reality to be changed into that of the cults. So change essentially means the process by which new information is given to the newly broken down person. That can be done through monotonous chants, lectures, and church services. In this stage, cults are able to change your frame of reference through their dogma, making some actions okay in the mind of members. For example, most people in the Western world believe in the equality of genders. Both men and women should be paid the same for the same amount of work. Jobs shouldn't be able to discriminate against someone based on their gender. Let's change the frame of reference to that of a religious one. In the Catholic Church, women aren't allowed to be priests. Despite many of its members and support for equality, this exception to the rule happens because the religion has been able to change the frame of reference. Let's look at another religion. Look at how confused people are at this TikTok. I don't think that's a woman for, oh, for religious reasons. Yeah, for religious reasons. In that case, I don't think I can speak to you anymore. Why? One group says to respect religion, while the other claims that this is sexist. Social media and Hollywood are very similar in how they change an individual's frame of reference. Here, there is no need for lectures or chanting. There is also no one leader that cultivates the dogma of how things are run. Instead, the dogma is upheld by common knowledge of the industry, coupled, of course, with an individual's vulnerability. If you want to succeed in Hollywood, you either do as you're told, because if you don't, someone else will. No one is forcing you 
Although that sounds okay in theory, this dogma has resulted in rampant child abuse. For instance, 16-year-old Judy Garland, starring in The Wizard of Oz, was forced to take diet pills and smoke cigarettes so she would lose weight. Because that's just how it is if you want to succeed. Similarly, there is a dogma in social media that is also upheld by common knowledge of how that industry works. This dogma has been able to change the frame of reference in Vlog Squad members, causing them to perform acts they wouldn't normally do. These acts may violate their personal boundaries and even the law. That dogma is, do it for the views. Arguably, dogma upheld by the public's common knowledge rather than the cult leader may be better at getting individuals to do what you want. For instance, this Vlog Squad member performs a dangerous stunt despite another member telling him he doesn't have to. He comes near me and he says, dude, listen, you don't have to do this. We already think you're cool enough. All right, you don't, this, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. So you, you can get off the moped anytime you want. Jason's thing that made me think to myself, holy crap, dude, I can't back out. This is because the new member wants to be integrated into the group, and he assumes that if he doesn't do anything viewworthy, someone else will. This is all common knowledge of how social media works. I'm doing this for views. But if this happened in the traditional space, it would be stopped immediately. The member was sent to the hospital that resulted in injuries from the stunt. When we got to the ER, when they took him into the room and they had a nurse look at it, she immediately called in another nurse and then another nurse at the and, puncture. Yeah, at the puncture, Fate because it was in a very bad spot. It was right by his and spleen, right by his kidney. It was it was in a very exactly. dangerous spot. More doctors kept coming over, and they kept asking us, when did it happen, when did it happen? And we're like, it happened about an hour and a half ago. And they're like, okay, the internal bleeding must not be that bad, because he would have passed away an hour, uh, about 30 minutes ago. Like, it was really bad. Wow. Like, it was bad. Like, he, like, he would have been dead by now if, if, it, if it was any worse. Not only does this affect the Vlog Squad Ensemble, it affects their fans as well. There was an instance in a vlog that was painted as normal at the time that probably shouldn't have been. Even I thought it was normal because that's the frame of reference in the vlogs. People are doing things for views. 19-year-old Kenna Mojo and 44-year-old Vlog Squad member Jason Nash decided to collaborate by doing a video where they would go on a date. So far, there's nothing wrong with that. There is an age difference, but both are adults and it's for work. The problem arises when the cameras are off. They were in the dressing room together. They were doing some kind of a sketch and the cameras were off. I've said this in my vlog before, and Jason, Jason felt something. Jason was like, this is, this is my time. She and went, she, he, and he leans in for a kiss. He just kissed me in the dressing room. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I really thought this was a fake date, and I think he just made it a real date. He just kissed me. I pecked you on the lip. Fake you kissed me. No. I will fight you right now. Literally, I will fight you in the morning now. I am wanting me to. See, the viewer is under the illusion that this is a glimpse at a random outing. But Tana and Jason are actually meeting for work purposes. They get paid handsomely for making videos such as this one. Vlogs do such a great job at changing a viewer's frame of reference into believing inappropriate behavior is okay. Because if everyone else is laughing, then that means everyone in the video was cool with this. What viewers fail to realize is that things are edited so they're unable to attain the full context of what happened. If you were to really examine the situation, it's no different from someone in the traditional entertainment space who uses their power and influence to trade opportunity for favors, if you know what I mean. The purpose of this outing was a YouTube video and nothing else. You hear a lot of female artists saying like, it's difficult to navigate because you don't know if someone actually wants to work with you or they're just trying to. Because vlogs are often framed as regular people doing regular things, viewers are manipulated into believing the situation is different. It's not. This is a business move. Though Tana has not called out Nash specifically, she has alluded to famous older men and their influence to take advantage of young TikTok girls. She also left a comment on Trisha Paytas' TikTok that discusses Jason Nash. 
This frame of reference change has affected viewers like me. Two years ago, I uploaded a video called How David Dobrik Manipulates His Friends. Despite the title suggesting that I have been aware of this problem for a long time, I also say this. Before you David Dobrik stands kill me, I don't necessarily mean manipulation in a bad way. I just mean that he has a certain charm about him that helps him get his way. This is a positive video about David Dobrik. The resurgence of the vlog squad's dark past has also resulted in the resurgence of that two-year-old video. Three very interesting responses came about from the new popularity of that video that suggest a lot about human behavior. One group of viewers felt that I was very intelligent for spotting Dobrik's manipulative actions way back then. Another group felt like I spotted the behavior, but was too scared of the stains to truly explain how I felt. And the last group felt I was really dumb for praising bad behavior. Now, despite answers varying, there's one thing all responses have in common. That is, they assume that as a third party, you're able to see on the surface that a cult is a cult. Some even say that because I have a degree in psychology, I am supposed to know this. Unfortunately, that is not how psychology works. Psychology does not equal psychic. If that were the case, Dr. Todd Grande would be calling influencers out left and right before any major news outlet did. No one does that. That's not how the world works. It's hard to spot a cult as a third party unless former members come out against the group and you're able to piece evidence together still don't believe me think of the most intelligent fan base that you know definitely not anyone who has young viewers but perhaps the most intelligent fans are those who watch educational content maybe people who watch ted talks over two million people saw this video and no one found anything out of the ordinary with it some of you if you've watched this may have found it eye-opening you know if you do watch the whole thing actually there really is nothing wrong with it well the woman speaking is allegedly running a cult, conning rich white women into taking classes and even going into debt for said classes. It wasn't until videos surfacing done by BuzzFeed and Anthony Padilla featuring ex-members that these videos attain criticism. Even then, it has barely left a noticeable mark. This lack of suspicion does not mean the cohort that follows the TED Foundation is gullible. Mind control has nothing to do with one's intelligence levels. Instead, it's carefully targeted so that it plays on your vulnerabilities and desires. Have you heard of Krishna consciousness? This part is a crazy man. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right, that'll work. A new and better life awaits you on our distant home planet, Plistonia. Hmm, makes sense. Being vulnerable and having desires is universal among all humans. In addition, the image we have of cults is extremely outdated, which is why some of you may have had a visceral reaction anytime someone called Dobrik's group this. But come on, if you saw someone approaching you like this, you'd run in the other direction. Even some of the modern news stories of these organizations paint members like an empty vessel hypnotized by some master manipulator. Smallville actress Allison Mack is pleading guilty. When I first came into Jeunesse, I had just come out of a relationship. It looks like Astrology she's a shell of the person material that I'm at. She's facing charges over what's being called a sex trafficking cult, the group Nexium. House. She and a friend of hers and this guy said, hey, I haven't talked to you forever. We want to stop by. And I hadn't seen her. She walks in. She was a different person. She walked in like she owned my house. Like literally, she owned my home. She walked in with her friends and they walked into the kitchen. I was like, hey, she was like, hey, how are you? And then walked into my kitchen, started bringing out pots and pans and started cooking. I go, uh, what are you guys doing? My friend Ethan's like, oh, what, what? he's like, we're hungry. After a while, I just felt uncomfortable. I was like, well, hey, guys, you know, uh, like, that's it. Come on, you know, let's, you know, let's. And I kind of asked them, like, hey, you know, you might want to leave soon. And I was kind of be nice. The guy turned almost violent. I mean, he was violent. Like, he. Who is it? I can't remember who it was, his name. I don't, because I didn't care. I just was like, who the f is this guy? Very angry and, like, just, I think he was on something. He was like, and he just started kind of cursing at me and Ethan. He was like, oh, you know what, buddy? I don't know what this is about. You just come in, you're cooking in my house. 
You guys don't even say that. Why don't you guys just go? Well, I'd actually like you to get the out of my house. I remember I was waiting for Alice and this sort of jump in and say, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. He doesn't mean this. It was nothing. It was just like, it was almost like they were zombies. Certainly, there must be something wrong with these individuals that they join this group. Depression, troubled family life. Professional people like you and I would never fall for this type of manipulation. Why do humans make this assumption? Why make the assumption that you, an outsider or any outsider, should be able to tell that the group is bad based on surface level information? First, accepting that mind control can be effectively used on almost anybody challenges the age-old notion that human beings are rational and in control of all their actions. Second, we all have a belief in our own invulnerability. It is too scary to think that someone could take control of our minds. We all want to have a belief in our own ability to completely control our lives. You see, if we admit this wasn't obvious from the beginning, we'd be admitting there's a chance that we too could be manipulated. That very element is why victim blaming is common in these situations. There must have been something about that person that caused that bad thing to happen to them. Because I don't do that, that bad thing won't happen to me. A big misconception is that you'll be able to spot a cult and be like, I'm not going to fall for that. But what's surprising about cults is that they can actually come in many forms. It could be a religion, it could be a business, a motivational seminar. No one's going to walk up to you and be like, hey, you want to join my cult? People say all the time, don't victim blame. But I don't know if they know what it is they're actually saying. According to Hassan, anyone can be a victim of mind control. So if I were to ask you that question on Instagram, what type of person is easily brainwashed or manipulated? The correct answer should be anyone. Let's see what you said. Woke people. People who are on the internet all the time. A libtard brother. Hell yeah, they need some education to make them smarter. Kona, Gen Z, Boomers, I'm sorry, but Karens, someone in some kind of vulnerable state. I will say that one translates to anyone because everyone has been vulnerable at some point in their lives and will still continue to be vulnerable at certain times. This answer is also acceptable to young children who haven't had time to form their own opinions yet. Insecure people who will do anything to fit in. Weak-minded people, someone desperate for a purpose. People pleasers, insecure people, no strong values of their own. Uneducated, shelter, naive people, uneducated. To give some of you guys credit, a minority of you did answer with everyone or anyone, literally everybody, as long as you're hearing what you want to hear. Very true. Anybody, if you know what's important, to them. As you can see, a majority of answers believe people easily manipulated have some sort of defect about them. This couldn't be further from the truth. Remember, when viewers of this TED talk and whoever was in charge of this thing were fooled, we don't want to believe that we are vulnerable to manipulation as well. So sure, maybe when I made this video two years ago, I was able to see behavior that was manipulative, but the frame of reference given to me was one of entertainment. Just like Dobrik's other 18 million followers, this was a show just like Jackass and everyone gave Dobrik consent. Now that you know, cults recruit people from all walks of life, social media changes the frame of reference for the Vlog Squad members and viewers, you begin to see just how damaging comments like it was obvious actually are. Not only can you respond by saying, well, if it was obvious, why didn't you make noise in the beginning? Why is this energy coming just now? But it's also one step away from victim blaming. Although I think most of these people are coming from a good place and are not actually victim blaming, their it was obvious argument fuels those who actually are victim blaming. Because if it really was obvious from the beginning, Victims should be able to avoid situations like this altogether. The reality is anyone can be a victim of manipulation and cult recruitment. In this case, viewers too are susceptible to whatever the influencer paints their image to be. One more frame of reference the viewers introduced to is the friend group. Vlog Squad, Team 10, and the Hype House. What do all these groups have in common? Well, they're all friends who moved into one place or a similar area and they make content together. They've also gone through some sort of scandal where their leader was accused of either manipulation, bullying, terrible work conditions, or all three. Is this a coincidence? Maybe not. Again, where is Vsauce's scandal?
Although viewers perceive these groups to be friends, it's very difficult for that dynamic to exist when there is an imbalance of power. David, is, he's like the boss, you know, he's an authority figure, he's a person that's in charge, and it's like you're going to kind of talk to your boss a little differently than you're going to talk to someone who's just your friend, you know? So I was just trying to communicate with him, like, you know, like, I, I really didn't like that, like, please don't do it again, like, I'm not, you know interested in being involved in any sort of content like that i feel like it's wrong i couldn't really approach the situation like hey bro if you do that again like i'm fucking out healthy friendships are equal in a give and take relationship you buy your friend dinner they may get you next time and buy you lunch employer and employee relationships are unequal the employer tells the employee what to do so that the company succeeds and the employee does it my theory about these groups often started by people in their early 20s is that having these two types of relationships is a difficult upkeep while david technically is not their employer they are incentivized to do his bidding because of the influencer hierarchy we mentioned earlier in this video while people on the top of the hierarchy feel like their friends are not being their friends because they won't perform a job individuals at the bottom of the hierarchy feel like their boss is terrible and overworks them the last step to gaining control of an individual according to sheen is refreezing the iceman cometh this step refers to their cult identity being built to replace their old self. Cult leaders must be sure that the individual's new reality can't be shaken, that their new beliefs and values must be completely internalized. Here they are given a new purpose in life with new activities. These lima beans are even better than the ones we had for breakfast and lunch. We ate it here, and your family wants to leave. No, we don't, mother. We love the leader. Coincidentally, the influencer lifestyle most likely does not look like the lifestyle you had back home. To help refreeze the members' new identity, some cults give them a new name. Guys, you can put this up. My name is Nick. <laughs> not Jonah. <laughs> the reason they call me Jonah is because that's the first thing David said when I walked in. You know what you remind me of? You remind me of uh, Jonah Hill. What the hell, yeah! <laughs> Dude, bro. Jonah Hill. really odd to me, like in a really cool way. Many also changed the person's clothing style, haircut, and whatever else reminded them of their past. The reason why he didn't want us to make YouTube videos solely because he didn't want the characters of his vlogs to kind of like lose track. We all had a certain track in his videos, like a certain life track, and he was worried that our videos were gonna kind of like show a different side of you, a yeah. different side yeah. of us. In his book, When Prophecy Fails, Leon Festinger described a cult believing in UFOs and flying saucers, whose leader claimed to know when the end of the world was. He told them he was in contact with beings from another planet, and because the end of the world was coming, they should give up to him many of their material possessions. They did. They gave him their homes, their money, while they stood on a mountainside waiting for the extraterrestrial beings to beam them up and save them from the end of the world. The next morning, the group saw the end of the world never came. Although a few became angry with the leader and used the event as a stepping stone in their decision to leave, this event made most individuals believe stronger in the group. Fast forward to this situation and we see Dobrik's crew follow suit. Although many have spoken up about the toxicity of the vlog squad, several events have resulted in members being injured, damaged personal branding, vlogs having violated a number of people. Basically, there is a mountain of evidence that suggests there needs a change. Why do other members still insist on protecting the group? When the story of Seth Francois and the kissing prank without consent first began to pick up wind on the Frenemies podcast, their first line of defense was a video by Scotty Sire, a member not even involved or accused to be involved in a prank. Not only was it strange that a group member decided to address the situation unrelated to him, Sire often used language that was collective. Typically, the blog squad does not address rumors and lies we know who we are we know our character we know we're good people and we know it's not true but all right we're gonna distance ourselves from you now the video was promptly deleted after receiving backlash this video was probably the only apology or addressing criticism video where i've seen that the friend made it and not the actual individual being addressed
In addition, Sire glossed over numerous points the public demanded answers to. It's extremely strange that Sire doesn't see the people he once called friends publicly speak against the blog squad as a red flag. Some of these former members don't even like each other, but their stories line up. Even Jeff Wittick, who was slammed on an excavator during a stunt, continued to see the group's actions as normal. Sure, he's asked David for reparations, such as wanting to see him skydive, but no safety changes to the group. Dr. Eamon was like, he brought up a lawsuit. And I was like, no, like that never crossed my mind. Like what we were doing was dumb and I'm dumb for putting my life in David's hands and what David did was dumb. But just the way I was raised, you know, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, I'm loyal. Despite being provided with countless evidence of their group's wrongdoings, members tend to defend him no matter what. This strength in belief can be explained by what Fessinger calls cognitive dissonance. When it comes to cults, Stephen Hassan believes it can be better explained by a similar concept called the bite model. The research into cognitive dissonance theory is robust and is used by leaders to control the group. To put it simply, the theory states that humans need to maintain order and meaning in their life through their thoughts, behavior, and emotion. If there is a discrepancy between those three things, dissonance occurs and causes us to find a way to reduce it. For example, let's say you're a smoker and perhaps you behave in a way in which you have a cigarette three times a week. You then come upon some heavily researched paper that convinces you all of the negative side effects that comes with smoking. This very event has led to a discrepancy between your behavior and your thoughts, creating what is known as dissonance. You know smoking is bad for you, yet here you are smoking. In order to reduce this dissonance, the individual can change their behavior and stop smoking, or they can change their thoughts and convince themselves that smoking through times per week isn't as bad as smoking every day. According to Festinger, if you can change one of these, the other three will follow. This is what makes cults so effective in controlling their members. Many are forced into living situations that control their behavior, which likely leads to their thoughts and emotions following suit. Taking what we just learned about cognitive dissonance, or in this case, the bite model, we can easily see how a leader keeps a group obedient. If you're able to change one of these, the other three are bound to follow. Look at behavior control. It's no coincidence these groups always move into some sort of commune together in the middle of nowhere. July of 1981, an organization known as uh, the Rajneesh arrived in uh, Central Oregon at the community of Antelope. Cult leaders want to control your routine and lifestyle so your information, thought, and emotion become aligned with the groups. On a smaller scale, you can see this in a church service for Scientology. There is footage of the congregation literally playing follow the leader. All you have to do is follow the command. Shall we begin? Yeah. Fit in your care. Easy enough, isn't it? Fit in your care. Very good. Fit in your care. Very good. Fit in your chair. All right. Fit in your care. Okay, here's the next one. Oh. Switch it up. Here's the next one. Oh. I mean, sure, it looks like no big deal, but the function of this exercise is most likely to prime you into letting Scientology control your lifestyle. Get used to doing something small at first, and then the ask becomes bigger and bigger. We've already touched upon the behavior change with Dobrik's crew. If you're moving to LA to achieve your social media dreams, you're changing your lifestyle. In the bite model, Hassan has added information control, which is the regulation of information available to members. Scientology, for example, discourages new recruits from researching anything about the organization online, and that if you want to know something, you must get it directly from them. Like, what do you guys recommend? Like, should I research it and like... Definitely not. Uh-huh. the worst thing you can do. It's the worst thing? Scientology. You don't think it's good to sometimes look at the, like, the negatives just to see like what their mindset is yeah we usually only deal with the truth uh-huh which is only found 
when you observe it for yourself rather uh -huh. than reading someone else's thoughts. This element in the model isn't really applicable to Vlog Squad individuals. They're all free to have their phones and computers. This is more applicable toward Vlog Squad fans, and it actually describes fans of any influencer. Fans only see moments that have been crafted to show them their favorite celebrity in the best light possible. That's done through editing and branding. If a video gains negative attention, Dobrik's MCN has also been known to wipe the internet of said video. David clearly has some protocol with his MCN with YouTube where if anyone uploads this clip, it automatically gets blocked. Which leads me to believe that David is in some form trying to suppress content that makes him look bad. People flip-flopping on the James Charles situation is the best example we have of this. The guy literally went from guilty to not guilty and now back to guilty. Imagine if he went back to not guilty. Damn. This event shows just how much withholding information or making it public can make or break public perception. <sighs> Thought is the next thing leaders take control of. Using our smoking example, let's say a cult's doctrine requires you to smoke. You begin developing breathing issues as a result, leading you to doubt the doctrine. It is essential for a leader to be in control of that member's doubt before it leads them to leaving. This is done through thought-stopping techniques like chanting and incorporating a new language system. Unless Dobrik and crew have a secret ritual we're unaware of, they have not been known to do weird chants. Just for your knowledge, though, you see this when Scientologists harass people who have left the church. The they aren't chanting per se, but they speak exactly loudly and call position. whoever they're harassing suppressive over and over again. This technique makes it so no outside information is able to penetrate.